The Christian in politics, here is what we've learned so far. In Sermon 1, we learned that the perception of many Americans is that Christians are too political, primarily motivated by a political agenda that promotes right-wing politics. Therefore, Christians should strive to change that perception by respecting people thinking biblically, and seeking solutions to complex issues in a Christ-like manner. In Sermon 2, we turn to the words of Jesus. And we looked at Matthew chapter 21, and there we learned that Jesus taught that his disciples have a responsibility to Caesar but a greater responsibility to God since God is sovereign over Caesar. In lesson three, we looked at Romans chapter 13, verses one through seven. And there we learned that Paul taught the disciples of Jesus to be subject to the governing authorities and being subject is determined by what is being demanded of us. So our relationship to the government could could be characterized as conscientious citizenship. In our sermon last week, we looked at a word from Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, we learned that our identity as Christians, as disciples of Jesus is to be noticeably distinct and that our lives are to have an inevitable social dimension by which they are to be judged. Or to put it another way, our Christian life is designed to be lived publicly. And being lived publicly, it's designed to be inspected. And upon inspection, it is seen to be different. And we learned that last week that Peter declares honorable behavior by disciples of Jesus can actually reverse public opinion about Christians, which links back to what we learned in Sermon 1. So this morning, we want to conclude this series of lessons, The Christian and Politics, And I want to begin where we ended last week, and that is in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17, where as Peter concludes this section that began in verse 11, among other things, he tells us to love, the NIV reads, the family of believers. Well, if you look at some of the other English translations as to how uh, this portion of verse 17 reads, you'll see things like brotherhood or simply brothers and sisters. You might see brotherly fellowship. Uh, The old living Bible simply reads, we are to love Christians everywhere. Uh, Eugene Peterson's message translates this as love your spiritual family. Well, the word that's translated by these various translations is a form of the word brother, but it means an association of persons having a strong sense of unity. So we are emphasizing this morning in our singing, in our praying, and in our communing together, and from the pulpit, unity. Love for one another. But I want us to see how how this concept of unity moves beyond just this political season. Now, we're talking about unity Uh, primarily today in the context of this upcoming election and recalling throughout the history of our country how divisive elections can be. 
So that's the primary context in which we're discussing this theme of unity this morning. But let's also understand it moves beyond just Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoon or the next week or even month to all aspects of our Christian lives. So let's begin this morning by asking this question. Unity, why is it important? Well, I want to suggest three reasons this morning, and if we looked at Scripture, we might could come up with even more. But number one, Jesus prayed for it. If you go back to the Gospel of John, and in John 17, between the time that Jesus and his disciples left the upper room and made it to uh, the Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is eventually betrayed and led off to be crucified, we have a series of discourses recorded by John in which Jesus prays a prayer in chapter 17. And embedded within that prayer, in verses 20 through 23, Jesus specifically prays for the unity of of all who would come to believe in him. So unity is important because Jesus prayed for it. But secondly, unity is important because God commanded it. We see this in two texts from the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10 and Ephesians 4 and verse 3. And we're going to read Ephesians 4 and verse 3 here in just a moment. So unity is important because Jesus prayed for it and because God commanded it. And also from John's gospel in chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, our evangelism depends upon it. In those verses, Jesus says that the world will know we are his disciples by the love that we have for one another. Wouldn't that make a good song, Tim? They will, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And, of course, the question is, do they? Do they? So there are three reasons as to why I believe unity is important. All right, so having settled that, second question. Well, what is it? What what is unity exactly? Well, I went to dictionary.com, and it lists five definitions for unity. Now, Now, listen closely and track with me here for just a moment. And I'm going to give you unity definition according to dictionary.com in the order in which it gives it. Number one, unity is the state of being one, oneness. Number two, unity is a whole or totality as combining all parts into one. Definition number three, unity is the state or fact of being united or combined into one as of the parts of a whole unification. Now here's where it becomes a little more tricky. Definition number four, unity is the absence of diversity unvaried, or uniform in character. Absence of diversity? Look around. We're a little different. And then finally, definition number five, unity is defined as oneness of mind or feeling as among a number of persons, concord, harmony, or agreement. All right, now just think about, for a moment, those five definitions of unity. According to some of those definitions, unity 
can be a little easier than according to other definitions given for unity. So as you, as you think about that, I want to go to Ephesians 4, and I want to focus on verse 3 and then on verse 15, or excuse me, 13. But I, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and I'll be, then begin reading in verse 11 to get the context of these two verses. Why are these two verses important? It's the only time in the New Testament that we actually see the word unity used. Only these two times. And the word simply means oneness. It comes from the word for one. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now let's skip down to verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of of Christ. Well, in these two texts, and again, the only two verses where we actually see the word unity used in the New Testament. Now, the concept you know, of unity begins in Genesis and continues through the maps in our Bible, right? But again, these are the only two verses the word actually occurs. And while Paul somewhat describes what unity is, and even though Paul somewhat uh, demands unity of us as disciples of Jesus, he doesn't technically de define it word for word like a dictionary. And so as I have thought about unity, not only for this sermon this morning, but in thinking about unity in lessons past and in visiting with others uh, about unity, the, the, the reality, at least for me, is it is hard to define because I, I, I struggle with definition number four from uh, dictionary.com where it reads that unity is the absence of diversity. You know, we emphasized several weeks ago from this pulpit that is one of the powers and strengths of the church is God through Jesus, brings a diverse group of people together wearing a common name with a common commitment, uh, being loyal to him and to our Lord, uh, and bringing us together as a family or as a community. So here's where I've settled, that even though unity may be difficult to define, we can demonstrate it. Because as, as we've shown in the past and as we realize, we are diverse and we are not going to agree about everything. We're just not. We're not going to agree on which football team to yell for on Saturday or Sunday. Right? We're not all going to agree on where to live, or what to do. We're all not going to agree on what the Word of God means for our individual lives. And in our context this morning, we are not always going to, to agree on how to vote. So unity, for me, does not mean we all are necessarily of the same opinion, and the same mind about everything. We're different. We are diverse. 
But recognizing that, we can still demonstrate unity. So how do we demonstrate unity? Well, I'm glad you asked. First way is brought to us by the letter A. We can acknowledge one another. We can accept one another. And we can assemble with one another. Now, that's pretty good, okay? But I like this one better. We greet, we eat, and we meet. You really want to demonstrate unity, all right? We greet one another, we eat with one another, and we continue to meet with one another. So however you want to define unity, what is most important, I think, is that we demonstrate it. And so even though we yell for different football teams, we can still greet, eat, and meet. Or we should be able to. And even though we might disagree on a particular passage of Scripture, Because we do share the name of Christ, we should be able, in spite of that disagreement, we should be able to greet, eat, and meet. And even though we may vote differently this week, we still, because of our common bond in Jesus, should be able to greet, eat, and meet. Let's demonstrate our unity. Now, building upon that, to help us with that, I want to suggest this morning that there are levels of unity. All right, now hang with me. Let, me. let me develop this a little bit. And this is based not so much on this one word, unity, that we see in Ephesians 4, verses 3 and 13, but it's based upon another word that we're all familiar with, we've all heard discussed in sermons and in Bible classes. It's the word koinonia, which simply means to have something in common. We sometimes uh, define or translate this word as fellowship, okay? And again, the basis of this word is is to share. It's a sharing. It's having something in common. And so as as we think about what we have in common with others, there are four levels, four levels of unity or fellowship that we can apply to our lives. Okay, first of all, there is a level of fellowship and unity that should exist among us right here at the Alameda Church of Christ. Okay? I mean, we all, I think, claim as our church home the Alameda Church of Christ. And so because we have that in common, because we share in that participation together, koinonia, We should be unified, and we should demonstrate that unity towards one another. Everybody with me? Well, a few are. All right. A few more laughed. Okay. Second level. Let's broaden that a little bit to sister churches of Christ. Do, Do we have anything in common with other churches of Christ? Well, probably. Probably. And again, because we share not only the name of Jesus, but a common heritage in the restoration movement, we should certainly enjoy a level of fellowship with fellow brothers and sisters in churches of Christ. Now, that can be a challenge, right? It can be a challenge often. But Again, Jesus prayed for it, God commanded it, and Paul 
tells us we are to attain it and our evangelism depends upon it, we should at least seek on some level a participation together in meeting with sister, sister churches of Christ. A third level, let's broaden it a little more. Again, just thinking about what we have in common with other people. What about our denominational friends? Do we have anything in common with them? They probably believe in the same God we do. They all claim the same Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're probably meeting somewhere this morning, just as we are. What I have discovered throughout my life with my denominational friends and those I have great relationships with is we have a lot more in common with each other than differences. Can we recognize that? Okay. So again, there's, there's a level of things we share together, okay, that we, can, that we can fellowship or experience a unity with those folks. So Alameda, Sister Churches of Christ, our denominational friends, but there's a fourth level that really then broaden it, broadens it, I think, as wide as possible. And that is with everyone else. Every one of us is created in the image of God. And whether we want to acknowledge it or not, whether all will confess that or not, it's true. It's true. Every human being bears the image of God. We have that in common with everyone. And so there is a fourth level of unity or fellowship. And in our context this morning, everybody else would include those we don't agree with politically. But we should be able, particularly those of us who wear the name of Christ, to treat those people with some respect to honor them at least on some level, and maybe even to greet, to eat, and to meet with those people. So when we think about unity, again, we've looked at three reasons why it's important. I've tried to emphasize that it's really important for us to demonstrate unity because we're not always going to agree on everything. And I hope I've shown that there are levels of unity or fellowship, which if we broaden what we have in common with others, we should somehow learn to respect those who are different or who disagree with us. Some of us may be familiar uh, with Francis Chan. He's written a number of books, wrote a little book several years ago on this topic of unity titled Until Unity. And here's what he says in this book. Our casual, dismissive attitude toward unity is incredibly dangerous for three reasons. And this is classic Chan language. God is disgusted with it, the world is confused by it, and it could be evidence that the Holy Spirit is not in us. That's Ephesians 4, 3. So as we conclude this series of sermons on the Christian in politics this morning, I want us to think about six things as we conclude. All right. Number one, I want us to take unity as seriously as we do baptism, the Lord's Supper, a cappella music, or anything else we deem essential to our Christianity. I, I hope we've seen and I hope we've recognized it's a big deal to God. It's a big deal to Jesus. It was a big deal to the Apostle Paul and all the others. 
So let's take this idea of unity very seriously. And let's, let's be challenged to greet, eat, and meet with someone who disagrees with us politically. All right, that's in the context again of this morning's lesson. Number two, maintain the priority of building relationships with those who are different. There are those who are different here at Alameda. There are those who are different in other churches of Christ. There are those who are different in all the other churches that are meeting across the country today. And there are differences with those we come in contact with, whether it's at school, at work, it may be within our family, our extended family, wherever. And here is how we can make it a priority and build relationships. Number one, we can decline to label people. I recall the first time I was ever accused of being a liberal. I had accused others in my past of being liberal. And for the first time in my life, I was accused of being liberal. And guess what? I didn't like it. I didn't like it. And I learned, I, I learned a lesson then about how I referred to other people. I'd like to stand up here before you today and say I've been perfect since then. I haven't. I have to repent of that, if not daily, weekly. So decline to label. Number two, determine to learn about that person. Have a conversation. Go drink a cup of coffee. Again, greet, eat, and meet. Go to lunch with that person. Have that person over for dinner. Do something. But determine to learn about them. You may learn that Again, the reality is you have more in common with that person than disagreement. And then number three, decide to love. Decide to love. You may not ever be able to to reach the level of a relationship that you desire. You certainly may never come to agree on all the issues. But you can decide to love. Which brings us to number three. You see, unity is a choice. It's a choice we all make. We all have free will. And so unity, fellowship, how we treat others who are different from us is a choice that we can make. Number four. I was really hoping the Lord came back before point four. He hasn't, which means, evidently, somebody here needs to hear this today. I've been encouraged to make a comment about Christian nationalism. What is Christian nationalism? Is it a threat to America or a tactic to marginalize conservative voices? Like anything else, you Google Christian nationalism, you're going to get about one million different things, all right? So, he, so here is my best to kind of help us understand this a little bit. First of all, Christian nationalism is not this. It, it doesn't mean a Christian can be patriotic. It doesn't mean a Christian cannot love their country. It does not mean a Christian can, can stand and show respect for the symbols of the country, whether it be a flag, a song, or a bird. I mean, it it doesn't mean any of those things, okay? A gentleman by the name of Drew Strait 
wrote a book that was published back in the summer, so it's, it's a relatively new book, titled Strange Worship. And I believe he does a good job of, of helping us understand the dangers of Christian nationalism. And I can't go into all that he says in the book. I would encourage you to read it. But he, he suggests six perspectives that could lead to Christian nationalism. Here they are. A loyalty that undermines a loyalty to Jesus. The President of the United States is not Lord of the Earth. Jesus is. Jesus is. Right? Number two, loyalty that inspires or celebrates harm toward neighbors. What are we told to do? Love our neighbor. Number three, loyalty that reconfigures our country as the system Central location of God's mission. God is restricted to the United States? Let's remember lesson two, the sovereignty of God. All right. Number four, loyalty to country that supersedes our baptismal identity. And we've talked about identity not only in this series of sermons, but in other series. I, I, I would like to think that first and foremost, myself and all of us uh, can identify as a priority as a Christian, not where we live or who we yell for or how we vote politically. Our identity, our primary identity is to be found in Jesus. A fifth thing, a fifth perspective according to Strait, that could lead to Christian nationalism. A loyalty that stimulates a caste system. And then finally, political posturing of absolute or differential trust to, to a government or governing authorities instead of suspicion and ambivalence toward political powers. Again, I believe those, those are six pretty practical even biblical things, some perspectives that I think we've addressed in this series of sermons. So just be aware of it. Be knowledgeable about it. Christian nationalism. Number five, be careful on social media. And, and here, here's what I've learned about social media. Duh. It's not so much always what I might post. But it might be someone I follow who then shows up on my feed. And guess what? I'm identified with that. So you got to be really careful about who you follow and who's following you. It's okay to unfollow occasionally. Now, you shouldn't unfollow me, all right? Don't do that. Don't do that, all right? But just be careful. Be aware of how that works, okay? And if you want to know how it works, go ask one of our college kids or one of our teenagers. They'll tell you, all right? And then finally, the reputation of God and the gospel is tied to the behavior of his people. You know the old adage or bumper sticker that reads, you may be the only Bible a person reads. It's true. It's true. I want to conclude with a quote. It's a paragraph from a recent book by New Testament scholars N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd titled Jesus and the Powers, Christian Political Witness in an Age of Total Totalitarian Terror and Dysfunctional Democracies. You thought I was the only one that did that. But I think this is a, is, a, is a powerful statement and a good way to conclude uh, this series. And one reason it's good is they begin this parag paragraph by quoting one of us, one of us, Lee Camp. Lee Camp is an elder for congregation in Nashville and has been on the staff at Lipscomb University for a number of years. Here's the paragraph. Lee C. Camp opened his book on Christianity and politics 
which is titled, by the way, Scandalous Witness, a little political manifesto for Christians, with a very provocative statement. The faith of the Christian is the great hope of the earth. Now, Wright and Bird comment on that. That claim will raise the eyebrows of people who think that progress, economic growth, nuclear power, nuclear disarmament, population reduction, social justice, socialism, diplomacy, open borders, religious revival, religious decline, or technology will be the savior for humanity's problems. Yet we believe with prophetic fervor and patient endurance that God alone is the world's redeemer. And this redemption comes to us in Jesus and by renewal in the Holy Spirit. Such a view does not imply that we should abandon the world to other agencies, withdraw from worldly ventures, or even leave everything to God. No, such a view calls us to action because if there is to be a day when God may be all in all, then our energies are quickened, not stifled, so that the emerging task is to get busy in the business of the kingdom. And that's the kingdom of heaven, by the way. Always excelling in the work of the Lord because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58.